Welcome, everybody. Uh, good afternoon. Um, good morning, good evening, wherever you may be. Uh, welcome to our Cultural Talk Story series. Uh, my name is Jose Barzola from the Matsunai Institute for Peace here at the University of Hawaii at Manoa. Today's event is co-sponsored by Aloha Care, the University of Hawaii Systems, and the Matsunai Institute for Peace. Our talk story today will focus on Kanaka Maoli, uh, recentering indigenous frameworks to be the basis for ethical and equitable innovation with Kamuela Enos and Dr. Keloa Fox. Thank you for joining us today to sit down at our table to learn about indigenous communities near and far. Uh, today's event will be live streamed on our community Facebook pages through the 100 Infantry Battalion Veterans Education Center, aka Club 100, Conflict Resolution Alliance, the KTOH Honolulu, and the Spark and Matsunaga Institute for Peace and Conflict Resolution. Uh, joining us today to learn about uh, Kamuela Enos, who is the first director of the Indigenous Innovation Office of the Vice President for Research and Innovation at the University of Hawaii. In this moderated session, he will share how the Indigenous people of Hawaii have calibrated systems that created abundance for current and future generations. Join two longtime friends in the virtual mountainside chat as they discuss a lot how lived experiences is guiding the university knowledge system to develop solutions for their contemporary context with an explicit focus on developing enterprises optimized for the repair and restoration and generation of peoples and places. Uh, well, to get started today, I will introduce our moderator, um, Dr. Kealoha Fox, uh, is a rising young Kanaka Maoli, Native Hawaiian scientist, practitioner, author, and mom working at Aloha Care. The recipient of more than 50 awards and distinctions, she, she serves on the Asian Pacific Islander American Health Forum, Doris Duke Charitable Foundation, National Congress of American Indians, and the Obama Foundation. Uh, to get us started, I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Kelo Fox. Thank you so much for joining us today. Aloha, Velina Maika, ko mahalo nui to the Matsunaga Institute for Peace um, for hosting this um, important session. Welcome, Ohana, Kuumohoa, colleagues, and OEV. My name is Keloha Fox, and I extend my aloha to all of you um, here into my home today. This is a this is going to be an intimate uh, mountainside chat um, from my home here in Hawaii, between the peaks of Mauna Kapu and Pal Palikea, um, just beside me here um, to the west, uh, which you see here in the the picture behind me is the White and I Mountain Range. This mountain range connects my Pico of present day with that of our featured speaker, Kamuela Enos, director of the newly created Office of Indigenous Innovation for the Office of Vice President for Research and Innovation at the University of Hawaii. It is here that our mo'olelo and our oral histories tell us that this time of year, makahiki and lono processions marked by the position of the Pleiades, which we call makali'i and the star Sirius, uh, anchor our Native Hawaiian ancestry to a deep and sacred pico on the island of Oahu. In this mountain range, there are many trails. They align our ancient westernly solar views of Pu'uokapule, not far from present day University of Hawaii, West Oahu, and just off to the left of me here in the photo behind me um, in my own backyard. On the other side of this ridge, Kamuela has worked for 11 years at Ma'o Organic Farms, where he served as the director of social enterprise. At the same time, he was uh, a faculty member at the University of Hawaii at Manoa in the Department of Urban and Regional Planning. He sits on numerous boards. Uh, he commits to a number of community-based organizations, nonprofits, and social enterprises, and was a commissioner on President Obama's White House Initiative on Asians and Pacific Islanders. To create space for this talk story segment, and the radical ride of Indigenous EK we're about to embark on together this short hour. I invite all of us to just take a brief pause from emails, from our multitasking, and I invite us to pool our mana, our energy, and our spiritual life force to be still in your space just for a moment wherever you are joining us in the world, now or recording later. The following poem are offers words of guidance from a beloved leader, an elder, and shared kumu for both of us. Her ike and cultural process is sacred to us who live on this side of the island because she is one of our own, just like Kamuela Enos. When I think about indigenous innovation, I know our Western Ridge from the top of Ka'ala 
to the Lena of Kauhane is more abundant and thriving in present day because of these two Kanaka Maoli leaders. From her to him to us, I invite Kako. Kako is a big idea. It includes an embrace more than you and me, her and him, she and us guys, we, the two-legged. It includes so many more than us. It includes the many-legged beings that crawl on their berry, bellies, the furry, scaly, scary, and odd. So when we think of who are the citizens of Hawaii, how do we include all of us? How do we hear and see include what they know and need? Let us give thanks to the people, our ancestors, who understood and embraced the fundamental idea of kako, written in June 2017 by Auntie Puanani Burgess. And so, with these words of kako, let's weave together abundance wherever we are this makahiki. Please insert into the chat the name of a business, a program, or nonprofit that is activating Indigenous innovation. Feel free to share their website or social media tags with one another to all of us in the chat. Help me welcome Kamuela Enos. Um, well, I love you know, my thank everybody for um, listening in. <laughs> um, for those of you who uh, heard me talk before Kalamai, <laughs> for those of you who are new Kalamai, um, my name is Kamwala Inos. I am the new director of Indigenous Innovation for the Office of Research Innovation for UH Mahanoa, um, well, for UH System and based out of UH Mahanoa. Um, I'm really humbled to be here today. Um, my dear friend Kiyaloha, when she asks um, yeah, to kind of share my leo, I always um, jump in. So I'm going to run them real fast because the word Indigenous innovation is one that I think has a lot of interesting connotations. And I only know from what the practices that we've worked on um, in my own family and own community what the definition means. Um, but before I do that, I just want to. Um, humble myself before all of um, the viewers. Um, for me, I always assume that I'm speaking to um, peers and fellow practitioners. So if anything I say is like Kano or off-putting, please correct me. <laughs> and please know that I um, only come to share and learn. And I appreciate your presence today. So I'll try to make the most out of it um, in this time. So the term Indigenous Innovation and is important, it's kind of set up where I'm working now, and I think it's an intentional act by our people to reclaim the language innovation. Um, and it's based in a lot of the genealogy of my practice, and I'll go over really quickly. Um, it's from Owa Okamuela, uh, he, him, pronounced, um, born and raised in the um, sovereign kingdom of what, and I, <laughs> uh, um, born in what, and I said, um, my dad is Eric Enos, uh, one of the co-founders of Koala Farms and in the these late 70s, he and a bunch of his peer, um, women, men, mahu, uh, Hawaiian, non-Hawaiian, uh, became the parcel of land in the back of Waianae Valley um, and brought water down to ancient Oikalo that eventually became Koala Farms. So I'm really lucky, I'm 47 and I would joke that I have 46 years of experience in working in the, in the restoration of traditional practices. Because um, I would try to milk it. I'm the eldest son of his, and my dad had zero work life boundaries, so I always was shotgun everywhere he went. Um, so, a lot of, <laughs> if I say anything smart, a lot of it is because of osmosis and uh, getting yelled at as much as I intensely intended to be a smart person in this work. But and that is kind of how we all learn and grow, I think. We are products of our environment and the environment that was crafted for me 
was crafted loving me and not just by my dad. I think the mana and the thesis, the mo'oko'oha, the genealogy of thought I carry was informed by the back of what and I valley um, and a bunch of ancient lo'ikalo that had been sitting fallow for hundreds of years um, and that were restored. And being raised in that context with the father that was having me <laughs> go up and read it and do all kind of crazy stuff. Um, and they were actively not just restoring Lo'i, but they were restoring a community and they were restoring an identity that had been lost. Um, really, it was a cause for a lot of epiphanies. And that's kind of the basis of where the work has evolved on to this day. So the first thing I want to just talk about, um, to me, why we would innovate is not to take us someplace else. The innovation is a process of carrying away the rubbish, as Antipoinami Berta says, to establish what used to be. The systems that were here for hundreds of years, and the innovation is in ours. The innovation is a kupuna that we are heirs to, innovated on, <laughs> and they took their traditions from South Pacific, and they spent hundreds of years in isolation in Hawaii on the most finite um, biosystem on the face of the earth and we'll be able to accrue abundance the generations through the different systems we created and that's the basis of our innovation is their innovation and how do we reclaim that space and make it and we live this notion of anti um professor manu meyer talks about indigeneity as a form of continuation like how do we pick that practice up and make it relevant to our times so the first thing i i think a lot about is the term we've created when i was working at Maui to describe our work. Um, uh, and I'll go over really quickly what Mao is in a bit, but I think the important point is the notion of um, the reclamation of ancestral abundance. That's what we're showing up to do, is to reclaim the abundance of our ancestry, not to transform our community to someone else's vision, not to do other things, but to understand our birth rate, reclaim it and make sure that while we may take the lead as Kanakas, everyone's invited and everyone benefits when the reclamation of our systems happen. So that's the first pick. I have some of the folks <laughs> that I work, I was super lucky to work with in Miskili. That was a land that I was in for years and the, the woman on the left, Kaui Sana, was my boss. Um, she's a next generation technical term for Kaui. She's a hammer, but she's also the, the current <laughs> operations manager um, of the Ma'o clans and the partners on the left, okay? Uh, shift. Um, to me, the first step in the work we're trying to do is to re understand the, to understand the language we use to describe our ancestry. Um, so I, I um, really quickly was born and raised in Wainai um, public school, thought <laughs> Wainai is a good job out, but I was also um, a product of Kala. And, I had a chance to see the juxtaposition of the systems that were set up for us as Hawaiian, the, the poor people of White and I and our public school system, and their assumptions of our capacity and our worth. And also being a Lo'ikalo that was hundreds of years old and see that system and hold them alongside each other and recognize, bruh, the systems of our ancestors are highly sophisticated, but you're in my classroom, they're telling us we were savages. So if that would have, I was like, no way. We have to figure out new ways to define it. And I found the word Hawaiian culture is really lacking to me, especially um, after I graduated with my GED, but I was lucky enough to go to college and people supported me. So I went to Leeward, YNI, uh, UWNL, University of YNI, the Longs. We started off at Leeward Community College, YNI Satellite. And I fell in love with learning there because in my first Hawaiian language course, I was taught by Kumu Gensila. And it was this really deep understanding of what we were doing and I was like why are we I love the word culture don't get me wrong but when you talk about culture and you've been programming for the state for example that's the first thing they cut because it's seen as oh that's nice if you can do culture things but let's focus on this um, and let's focus on these things I was like nah we had sciences that's what we're doing so I started thinking about you know let's reclaim these, let's choose the right, if English isn't our first language, um, let's choose the right words in English at least to describe what our ancestors were doing. So I started telling everybody, I don't say Hawaiian culture, I say ancestral sciences and technologies of integrated biosystems management. 
and the sciences for me allows us to be in the academy and the technology allows us to have an industry. And I started from that point. So that's the first thing we talked about. Um, is in my, in my communication is became the language. Um, and I focus on two core words that everybody kind of uses in Hawaii, whether or not you um, speak Hawaiian or not. Um, um, the first one is the idea of and the reclamation of Hana. So can you move this slide down? In, in getting and going to college, I got my bachelor's in Hawaiian studies back in 2002. So I was lucky enough to have um, Haumani Trask, it's my Kumu, Dudu Kalaka, Ma'ele Diva, John Osorio, um, Dr. Kanalu Young. Uh, they're all like my Kumu. And I just like, it was such a really mind blowing experience to kind of come from a space where I was working in a cultural practice, but we didn't have, like, my father and his peers weren't historians, they were activists, and Hawaiian culture to me was a pit <laughs> and hard work and labor and listening to kupuna. But when I went to Hawaiian studies, then it was like, no, it's a syntax, it's a science, it's a rigorous discipline that you have to match the practice of with your intellectual, this, this intellectual um, canon. And I was like, whoa, that's super cool. So the first thing I started realizing that in Hawaiian language and English, there's being taught the idea of epistemological differences. You can't use the same word to just, you can't use, casually use words between languages to describe the same thing. Like words are taught to you by the landscape region. And if you use one word in another context, you're using it wrong. So the first thing we started understanding and my thinking of, well, how do you uh, indigenize, um, which is kind of what I'll get to as a framework, um, was we have to understand the core concepts of our society as I was exploring them, and we redefine them and deconstruct them. And the first thing I started understanding, like the basis of our ancestral systems are, um, was the notion of hana, was work. Um, but when you say work in English, that's a 9.5. It's just kind of, it's seen through the lens of um, a global capital <laughs> market economy. So it's this thing, but to our kupuna, the ancestor here, um, hana, your economy was your ecology. Because our ancestors of Hawaii had a non-monetary economy. We didn't abstract the, um, wealth into coinage and then create this abstraction that creates currency. We practiced on tree wealth. Like you could actually go outside <laughs> and see how healthy your economy was just by walking up and down the stream. Were people fit? Was the water flowing? Was there food growing? You're rich. <laughs> Join the meeting. That was a really important understanding. So the first basis I think a lot about was Hana as um, identity. Um, the people who live in Hawaii were able to live in valleys, complete isolation, and be self-sufficient not only on the island, but in the watershed. So therefore, the economy was hyper-localized and was really attuned to both the carrying capacity of the landscape and the needs of the community. So that was the first basis we started thinking about in innovation. The second, um, this, can you move this slide down? The word I started thinking about was ohana. Um, if hana was what we did in our systems. Ohana was the unit in which we did it. And when you say family now in English, uh, maybe it's different. When you, if you live homesteads or some other places, but for most of urbanized Oahu, ohana is your last name. And then the families that live down the street from you, you know less and less of in orders of magnitude as it moves down. Um, in pre-contact society, what I often thought was really powerful is that um, in Ahupua, everybody in the valley was your family, and then the valley itself was your family, and that you couldn't separate in this context who was your family member from who was your employer, from who was your educator, who, from who is your spiritual center. I mean, they're all the same people. So that was this really powerful unit. Our economy was our ecology, and it was also our spiritual understanding of the world. Our family unit was our valley itself, <laughs> as well as the people who shared the work with you. And those two principles, Ohana and Hana, took on a new meaning to me because they sat in stark contrast to what we would see in our own communities in English. 
So that growing body of knowledge in Hawaiian studies that got me excited was like, okay, well, how do we apply it? And then what's, what happened, right? So then the next slide to me um, speaks to the severing. So why do we need to innovate? Um, when we severed that traditional system, the world view that we had, the first thing I learned at Ka'ala, the big aha moment I had with you and my dad, it wasn't too much later in life. And I was pretty sure it's because I was really hungover and weed eating in the back of a valley in summer, being really frustrated and being like, just had this epiphany. Like, our ancestors were never poor. Even though we in Wai'ina are considered impoverished, they could not have been beating each other up, drugged out, just unhealthy, and create this majestic system that, of, 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 of what we call that extended an OI system that's going from the top of the mountain all the way down to the fish pond. They had to be functional people. They had to have a functional society. Our poverty in our community was recent and learned behavior. And then I began to understand, well, we need to reach past that point in time when we learn to be poor to ground ourselves in what the principles of our ancestors were. And then we have to shoot forward past the part where we're poor to reposition ourselves as agents of, um, in our communities to have agency, to have choice and control in our own lives. So, so much of the work that has come out of this space was the idea of how do we, how do we understand if you can't fix poverty and ecological issues in silos, the roots of our dysfunction, the roots of our poverty is based off of the severance of our traditions and our traditions always are tied to landscape. So, so much of that space, like, well, what do we do about it? We figure out how to restore those systems, but we have to do it smart and we have to do it in a contemporary context. So next slide. Um, so that's kind of where it came up with this concept of indigenizing. And I think to me, it's an important one. The, the rigor of Hawaiian studies when I was there in the late 90s, early 2000s, was a strong focus on decolonizing and to remove this really pervasive and, how would you say, insidious notion that you and your ancestors were insufficient that you had to adapt to this new system to belong in current contemporary society. <clears throat> and that was a real struggle um, because it sounds romantic, but there's a lot of basic realities that the economic system, the system of education, all these things are embedded within the contemporaries, the contemporary structures that are stressed upon you. So how do you do that well? And how do you do it by not just rejecting that system, um, one of the gifts my dad gave me when I was 16 is he had us um, build our own house because we complained about how small our house was. And I've learned not to complain about things super loudly from my dad. I also learned how to build a house um, from scratch. Um, and the things that was really fascinating was we had to demo that year a house too. So we demoed this house. Then we had to build a house. And demoing a house versus building a house is two very distinct skill sets. Um, demoing the house is a lot about where is your load bearing beam. If you take all the electrical stuff, if you want to save, if you want to salvage, then have that. Building the house requires so much rigor. It requires so many different skill sets. When I started seeing Hawaiian studies, I was thinking a lot about building a house when I was in there. I was like, you know, we, it's good that we're going to demo something, but if that's our house and we never build a new one, we're going to be asked out because we're not going to have a house to live in in the demo of something. So how do we build a house? So that's when I started thinking a lot about the idea that came up with indigenizing. And I do not say it to belittle or demean the idea of decolonizing. We cannot do indigenize unless we're doing decolonizing first. But to me, what indigenizing means, or at least concurrently, and I don't think it's linear, it's probably cyclical. Um, like everything, but is to, to, um, to repurpose the structures that are thrust upon you to be vehicles for your ancestor responsibilities. So that was a big thing about like, well, how do we indigenize things? And like, well, what is indigenizing? Like, 
I've, I've felt examples where like you watch a long video on the Ecolo being done by a wonderful little plan filmmaker and you see this picture of Carol and blowing in the wind and the water is shining off of it like we always show in the background. There's a slacky guitar that's playing beautifully and it just goes along so perfectly. Right? Yeah, nothing about that slacky guitar is Hawaiian except the person playing it. Everything about it was imported to Hawaii. The guitar itself is probably made with nylon strings and concealed from the other places. So the person playing that guitar is so imbued it with the sensibilities of his and her answer, their ancestry, that it just becomes that one. And look at Kula Awana um, and all these other examples of people taking ideas and processing them, vetting them, screening them with the rigor of does this fit what we do, but understanding really clearly too in the process of taking things in, what is our ultimate kuyana? What is our responsibility to our people and to our landscape? And how do we bring things, things in? And how do we account for the changes that are going to happen? That's kind of how I think about indigenizing. Um, I'll kind of run through this because I think part of I want to get to the questions and answers. So that's a long day, so I'm cabling myself. I think a lot of it is a framework that we put together when you're not always um, Kind of under, understanding Uncle Kikui's um, um, Blaise Dell's Manau of the Hoko, of your Fontanelle, of your navel, and of your productive organs, your, your Pico um, Ho'o, which is your connection to your ancestors, your Pico um, Vaina, your navel, which is connection to the owl, to the living, and then your Pico Ma'i, or your Pico um, Wee'ewe, your reproductive organs, that's your connection to the future. So we start thinking about, well, let's, how do we create a framework to help us with indigenizing? So the first idea of the thing we vet is, what is the ancestral system in the people we, what specific ancestral practice are you bringing with you into a contemporary space? And research it with rigor. Name it, have a literature review about it, practice it, so you know it not just in your brain, but you, you know it in your body. And then the third part of that people or analysis was um, the aha moment that you have in this application that says, oh, this makes sense. And now because this. So that's the first part of the analysis. The second is, well, how will that ancestral system being deployed in a contemporary time provide the people of that genealogy and of that practice the restoration of agency? having the ability more and more to get executive control of their community, to have choice and control. So how does that ancestral system begin to empower the contemporary generations? And that's the second layer that we look at. And then the third layer, the last slide, move on to the is on, um, well, how does that contemporary empowerment provide a platform for future generations in inalienable right to abundance? So how are you setting up the guys down the line, um, the, the Kanaka down the line, in the face of climate change, in the face of all the things that we know are coming, how do we give them a platform to thrive and have agency to not make, I'm not saying easy, not to make their lives easy, to give them agency to do something about what they're facing based off of the ancestry we all hold and our work now. Can go forward real fast to that. Um, so how do how do we do that? This is the stuff we brought over from Ma'o that I'm doing with TH. The first thing is um, when we worked at Ma'o Farms, Ma'o was an example of an indigenized organization. Um, the founders, Kukui, Maunakea, and Gary um, Forth, who a uh, husband and wife team. If you don't know about Ma'o, I won't go too much into it. Um, they're becoming more and more ubiquitous, so I'm glad I don't have to cut too much context for the organization. But in essence, created a social enterprise based in White and I. They send young adults from White and I Moku to college by running the operations of what is now the largest organic farm on the island of Oahu. And they're set up as a social enterprise. Um, the basic premise is that young adults sign a contract to work with the farm, it's a nonprofit, um, for two and a half years in exchange for sweat equity of 16 hours a week on the farm, Monday, Wednesday, and Fridays. They were provided a full tuition waiver to college and a starting monthly stipend. At the time, I was there, $550. 
and they're asked for a two-year commitment to graduate on time with their associates and then move on to their baccalaureate degrees. So that was the basic premise of like, we're doing mahi ai. So mahi ai isn't funny. Mahi ai was the people that could attend to the system for free within the valley. And they had to have a complex and complementary set of skills, but also they were as important as the crop that they grew. So we didn't exploit labor and the soil was as important as the labor and the crop. So the intersection of people, the crop and the soil and the water were all equally important. And none of them were harmed in the making of the product. That was the key idea of, so that's what Mahia is. How are we gonna do that and why not? So that we're providing an empowerment. And so the first thing we think a lot about was how do we convene? So if you um, scroll down, in the process of taking this idea and convening it really quickly, this is the structure. So the two things that um, was tracked on a daily basis on model was sales of product and GPAs of students. Um, and that was super critical because what it would help us do in the sales of product was we could say that the highest and best use of land in Waianae is growing organic food, not dumps. <laughs> and we could have a better business plan to say, this is how we defend our, our food base here from predatory practices and want to put the next dump in. We're going to have a better business plan that can show the ROI it makes a lot more sense. Um, and also the GPA that we assign um, for our students, GPA is a poor indicator of a well-being for a person, but in the community I've come from, it has high school drop away and no college attention that GPA becomes a path for agency. It locks them into a way that they can advocate for a community and they can get a college degree and they can get a better paying job, all of that. So there's two metrics of sales and GPA it shows value to the system that are thrust upon us of our land and the value of our people. But what is more important than anything else though, is not to hit the metrics um, to affirm the system. Those are the same two metrics that our ancestors use when they, um, at the end of year, every year, we are now Makahiki, when the chief would come to the valley and the people would present to, before the chief, hey, this is what we've done for this year. But the Makahiki to me is the year end reporting. And the two metrics that the chiefs are looking at, how fit is the people and how abundant is the landscape. So we're using the metrics of our ancestral systems captured in contemporary structures so we can access resources in a contemporary way but our success doesn't really need us from our birth rates or responses. That's just a quick snapshot of how we're trying to um, use our ancestral systems and, and the work that we're doing. You can go down to the fast killer. The second framework we did is understanding how our values were set up. And our values were set up along waterways that a person at the top of the pole by track the water down and the laws of the land was described through the language of water, the Kanaway. The same water was shared with everyone through the valley and it terminated in an estuary. And where it terminated, it was so enriched for everyone sharing that it fed the near shore ecosystem and that then fed the Pelagia. So our ancestors could live within a valley and increase the ability of the valley despite increasing the community size. Um, the impacts were there, of course, but they weren't as detrimental as we see now. So we use that same thinking to understand, well, how do we organize within our community? And when I started working in Mao, we could see all of the fractures and the silos that are happening around this work. The students in high school is not knowing what they're gonna do with their life. High school is not knowing what's gonna happen to the students. Colleges, after they graduate, colleges looking to recruit not young Hawaiians, or not even Hawaiian, but kids from Hawaii, that's poor, that are <laughs> trying to matter ethnicity trying to figure out how do you make a life for yourself. Funders and policymakers um, wanting some type of magical way to fix the poverty of the systemic poverty you see in community and labor and looking for quality workers. But these were all of the fractures. So when we put everything together, that we framed it like an OI, and that's the next slide. We de-siloed everything and linked the services up together and treated students like the most precious resources to our water. So we would get everyone together and say, okay, high schools, you, know, you gotta graduate kids, you work with us, I guarantee you, we'll get you some kids in the college. And we're gonna make this longitudinal. 
So you're not going to sign up for the first semester, buy a room, with the scholarship, and never see the money again. We're going to track, we're going to figure out recruitment, retention, and matriculation. So we put them on a pathway, and we say, we, um, we allow funders and policymakers to look at a tranche longitudinal approach to it. We can track someone from 10th grade all the way into employment. And this is the person that you're actively targeting. So you're asking for fair investments and fair terms and a long-term relationship with us as we see this true. And as this, the workforce side, we treated the students not as laborers, um, but as leaders. The name of the internship I model was the youth leadership team, not farming at college. So we taught them everything from cultural proficiencies to how to actually run a farm, how to run a business, the basics of emotional intelligence, um, your cultural, your, your chance of the value, all of these things were woven into that pathway. So that's kind of how we deploy this as an OI. Okay, this slide for follow. And I think that's the last slide. Um, I mean, the last section is just the whole ether. The, you can't just say things, you have to do things. And you can't just do things, you have to present before people to show that you've actually accomplished something. So these are some of the metrics of um, the outcomes of some of the work that we've been doing on the idea of indigenous innovation. This is a real quick one, this is when I was a lecturer, but this is one of the things that was really fascinating. We worked with my friend, Anthony Deleuze, who was a little Ikalo in the middle of the Kirwood shopping center. And we had our students, um, Nigel Rosette and Cole Hendrickson, two really brilliant graduate students. They're more Kumu seniors. I'm a Kumu, but they're already Kumu level students that was Hamas in the class. Help me um, put this together with the basic ideas like, well, what if we have a, a traditional practice in the middle of an urban landscape? What are all the discrete services this traditional place of practice can be providing an urban community? And then when you scroll down a little bit, um, we brought the stakeholders together. And then we scroll down a little bit. Um, and then Nigel and Cole created this really powerful framework where we had looked at all of the inputs on one side and then <laughs> an orange, all of the outputs of a cow farm in the middle of Pearl City. And we started doing the math. <laughs> we didn't get too far in it, but I'm pretty sure the layered ecological, social, and business um, benefits are pushing this what we call it into at least low six figure annual. <clears throat> like, this isn't just someone doing tarot and pro city. This is someone that's actually restoring these vibrant systems. The second project that I'm part of is with Kukumaya. Um, we are uh, founded by Native Hawaiians, and they're actually co, Kukumaya and Ma'o are co. Um, they called the Office of Indigenous Innovation at TB. Um, but, um, and they sent it for to Vice President Vasilis and he was just telling me, he's like, sure. So Kukumai is another of a founding partner of the Office of Indigenous Innovation. And we're kind of looking at this idea of how do we treat our ancestry as a technology and call it that. And then find ways where ancestral technologies um, um, can be deployed in creating technology now that doesn't just serve technology as an end goal, but like our ancestral technologies were a means by which we calibrated between our natural, societal, uh, human, and spiritual world. Our know, well, system, for example. So like Dr. Kiana Frank had worked on a project on um, with the Makaha and machine learning um, to track fish that were coming in to the Makaha at Pai Pai to help the practice of Kilo provide um, practitioners with a broader array of tools. And the idea of ancestral technology is it didn't supplant, um, it didn't supplant the practitioners, it enhanced them, it allowed them to practice better, but kept them in place, which is a big thing about the technology supplant us. This is why we need to be in that space. So I think the final slide I'll go to and I'll, I'll just open up the conversation um, is some of the metrics of the uh, model. One more. I think yeah yeah we, we uh, lost her for a little bit but I imagine she'll be joining us shortly 
<laughs> I was just trying to shut up. Anyway. No, uh, no, no, no. It's wonderful. I think it's important that like, it's kind of like it's lay the framework, but I know that we have about 20 minutes left, so I think that was a good time to put a period on it. Um, and I see as we wait for her to come back on. I guess the last thing I'll say is um, when we, I'm really excited by this opportunity to be back in the university. Um, I think there is, there is a lot of challenges that we all face. And I think coming on board right when COVID hit, um, I, I think we probably kill I think we can just go, um, to just do the, the questions and answer part because I think I don't want it to be overly didactic. I, I know there's probably questions. Um, but I guess the last thing I was going to share was um, that you know, we have some real challenges in front of us. And I think, I believe the mentors I had, I went to Pornani Burgess and, and others, were really. Um, fearless in their willingness to collaborate. Um, and I come from the school of fearless collaborators, but I've also passed through <laughs> Hawaiian studies and had some ferocious, no, this is the lines, these are the parameters, we will not compromise on these principles. So I think that's the beauty of universities because you do both. This is space to draw lines, but this is space to ID. And I hope that being at the university can continue that strong tradition we have of um, trying to, to have these, re and, and learn this is a process we would do a lot in model is like how to ask dangerous questions lovingly <laughs> and then hold yourself accountable to, to that process. Um, the, the role of Office of Indigenous Innovation is to a, identify resources that can be brought into university to be um, invest in Indigenous innovation that's happening through our brilliant network of Kumu, the faculty, um, and campuses, to the students um, doing this work to see great prototypes that can scale to show the efficacy of ancestral thought. And it's really important that we have to talk about IP, we have to talk about ownership, but that's what the university is designed to do. And we have to also talk about how do we not just have this conversation in the university, but how do we have it in community? And like how I've always thought about the idea that indigenous innovation is like ancestral systems being deployed by contemporary communities through the lineal descendants that are going to solve for future issues for so I'm a year in, <laughs> more or less, um, and I have some initiatives that we're working on, helping with um, PVS's Physical Voyage, working on a project out in Moku Oloi, um, with um, Hei and we're doing our incubator called New Futures, where we could connect cohort of youth students through the process of um, exploring and creating prototypes, but also learning about appropriation. <laughs> <laughs> about what is how do you create business plans with genealogies and how do you understand if you're going um, to build something um, if you're non Hawaiian what does that mean if you are Hawaiian what does it mean how do you build in the layer of um, economic how do you treat economics like the ancestors of this place did where by being successful the measure of success is the equation of abundance around you versus one person becoming more and more materially wealthy. Because those types of chiefs always ended up in the in a few really chiefs. So it's kind of like this really interesting back. Um, you know, I don't know if Killer is gonna be able to come back, but maybe um, what do you think? Um, do you think you can just open up for questions or if you want to put questions in the chat? I would love to check in. Um, I'm here, sorry. Oh, no. <laughs> Did you come here? I was like, oh, okay. I, um, I, I apparated, and then now I'm back. <laughs> yeah, so Paula, maybe we can just kind of have some of the questions. Paula, I know you ran super long. Paula, this is great. Um, are, 
we're okay with where um, we left off when I got um, kicked out for the PowerPoint. Okay. Um, so let me, I'll just take a minute. We're going to weave together some of the, con, you know, concepts and constructs where uh, we started with Kako, Mana, Kiko, the concept of Hana and Ohana being, you know, a real uh, symbiotic way that you have created um, the philosophy to the work, but then you've also brought in uh, these Makahiki metrics and you've looked at the Awai articulations through various social enterprises, uh, courses, curricula, and classes with much success. So um, we're inviting folks to share in the chat. I know um, there was a question um, that I had seen inserted on um, what is some of the advice that you have and, and how do you structure um, your teaching for Indigenous innovation for those um, who grow up and live and work uh, primarily in urban uh, environments in the urban core as opposed to uh, rural areas? Awesome. Yeah, that, I forgot to mention that project we did with um, Anse de Luz, the Kaunoi Farm, we basically came up with the term urban Aino. And that's an emerging thing that we're really excited about um, is how do we look at our urban spaces um, as the practices happening in urban spaces to explicitly um, looking at those practices and how they are creating more than just value for an urban center, but more importantly, they're seeding an urban space with indigenous ideologies that help. I mean, my grandma and I, I love going to town, so I was super country. I used to love the fact that we could go to town. So this urban or rural is not necessarily bad to me, but I think each of them has their own intrinsic challenges. And one of the challenges I have often felt about urban spaces is disconnection. And having, how would you connect not just to land, but also people. And that's the weird kind of dynamic of urbanism sometimes fosters isolation. So having indigeneity and in kind of spaces for indigenous practices and naming it something is a key part of what I want to continue to carry on in the office and start to um, identify and promote projects that are kind of working under that moniker. Great. I think that's a, a great segue for um Another question that we had on, we have a lot of students and faculty and program leaders um, joining us today. What message can join the meeting. What me what message of ethics and equity do you hope that our indigenous students and Haumana take away with them today um, as they many of them are, are getting ready for their finals. They're closing out um, this fall semester and they're already preparing for a uh, spring semester. Um, ahead? I think ethics and equity is everything. Um, I think there's always, it is not a box you check, but it's a dynamic living thing you do every single day you wake up. And I think if you're an indigenous person and you kind of felt the weight of that, then you know what it's like to actually have that kind of pain. So as a cis male, I'm on the journey of understanding what does it mean to be an ally to my mahu ohana and to mahime, the people who identify these um, spaces. And that doesn't mean that I go to a sensitivity training <laughs> and check a box. That means I spend the rest of my life trying to understand and listen. So I think the ethics of um, the work is really rooted in a commitment to listening, a commitment to being vulnerable in that space, but also a commitment to busting your ass. <laughs> and I think that, that, and when you, when you work really hard in that space, the work is hard, but it's joyful. Um, and I think I've learned to describe joyful as when happiness gets his ass kicked and decides to still be happy. It's like, I'm going to come back to it and I'm going to commit to this work. And I think the joy lives in this idea of how do we show up in a society where the, where it's not the most violent who make the rules, where it's the most thoughtful, and it's, the, and it's, it's a true meritocracy, but not just in creating widgets um, that is your gauge of success, it's creating a connection, creating a sense of how to do it together. 
And I think the world that's coming is going to ask us to be a lot more connected and invested in each other's well-being if we want to survive the radical changes we're seeing. And we're going to have to be a lot more connected and invested in the well-being of the landscapes around us so that we can watch properly and adapt properly. And those types of things were the hallmark of indigeneity. And indigenous is not a brown person thing. Indigenous to me is a state of being um, before we adapted um, the broad types of industrialized society that we live in now. Um, but when you are in a place where the indigenous people are still alive, you have a responsibility to their well-being, not out of guilt, but because their well-being and the restoration of their systems brought into a contemporary landscape will give you the tools to guide, to guide the collective work towards calibrating whatever is going on in that space back to something that is in alignment. And ancestral systems to me are like thousands of years of R&D and how you live in place. So how do you mind those systems with ethics, understanding whose systems are they, what's their responsibility, how is it, all of these agreements have to be made. But when the agreements are made in equity, then you can actually create things that you see at Ma'o and Pekumaya that are both successful and contemporary and ancestral kind of frameworks. And it's an open invitation. That's kind of how I would frame it. I think the last question um, that we'll have time for is um, your, you know, your, your office is, is fairly new and many universities um, and colleges around the world don't have indigenous offices um, for the lands that they sit upon. What hopes do you have for your office um, going into next year? And then where do you hope to be five years from now? Is there ways that those of us part of the University of Hawaii system can support you in this work to ensure that it's uh, sustainable and a long-term commitment? Uh, five years from now, I hope this will be here now. <laughs> I think five years from now, I think we want to be able to, um, we're in the process of doing a strategic plan. I'm gonna be working with one of my peers to Makabalua to look at the different parts in our strategic plan to then fold into our HR manual. And in doing all of that, I hope to codify the process so that I don't, I'm not aware of another Office of Indigenous Innovation with any major R1 university in America, or, or yeah, what you might depending on how you want to look at it. So if we can codify it, I see there's a lot of opportunities to empower other communities to take the same steps. And that is one thing I'm hopeful for, that there will be other Offices of Indigenous Innovation that are created by the Indigenous communities because the indigenous communities have the capacity to create them. That we're no longer just, oh, we're a dying race and these are the horrible things. It's that and. We're also resilient and we claimed our system in contemporary formats. Um, and we're starting to see these types of outcomes of efficacy that allow us to scale. And that restoration of our practice is not the successes of it aren't just limited to our communities, but others around us their lives are enriched because of the ancestral, um, the lineal descendants are able to reclaim their systems. So that's kind of what I hope to see in the replication and then some of these broader KPIs coming out of people reclaiming the practices and things becoming more resilient, but also more authentic to place. I think that's uh -huh. kind of five. Oh, so though brief, I hope that this is a great way for folks to um, not only learn about the Office of Indigenous Innovation that you're leading, um, but think of ways that they can potentially uh, be involved and to learn more. Um, we hope that your time with us, you know, we're two longtime friends doing our best to normalize Indigenous systems as a means to articulate resilience and abundance in our communities. Um, you know, I, I really want to thank you, Kamu. Um, you know, Kamu, I often introduce Kamu as, this is my brother Kamu. This is new office. Um, you know, our families are so close. Uh, fun fact, uh, in 2006, uh, the first person I, I worked with in the Enos family is Kamu's mom. And so we shout out to Kamu's mom right now for raising all of these uh, tremendous boys and especially for, um, the, the articulation of Sullivan's art. Um, what a great and beautiful way to visualize the many different ways that we as Indigenous people are innovative. Um, Kamu, if you have any final words um, of hope and reflection for you before we let um, 
the Matsunaga Institute for Peace closes out. Make a mahalo nui a make a ha ha a kako. That um, everyone's collective tifuna, not just the Kanaka Maoli, but all of your collective tifuna that you brought to this space. And I have bad boundaries, so if you have any questions, uh, you can put my email in the chat. That's how bad my boundaries are. But if you, I have Puliana to the entire entire university, I'm not just the Hawaiian Press University. So I, I'm really eager to figure out how, how we serve. Um, and in service, how our people can reclaim agency again, and then we can start to bring about the abundance that was here for a thousand, over a thousand years. So, mahalo pa kayo ako for tuning in on three o'clock. And mahalo nui, kialoha, and to the Masanaga Institute um, for having me. I'm really humbled to have been talking to all of you today, and I'm just excited to see uh, how we can continue to be in dialogue. Aloha. Thank you so much. Uh, mahalo to Kealoha and Kamuela uh, for providing us this wonderful opportunity to learn about your community. Uh, well, for our, all our communities, really, for everyone here who's in, in Hawaii, uh, thank you for assisting us to make this event a reality. It was truly a, a, a treat. Uh, uh, just Kamuela, I truly appreciate your insights into the focus on the indigenous peoples of Hawaii to provide guidance as we move forward into definitely these uncharted shifting um, situations and challenges ahead. Um, and thank you, I truly love the reminder of collaboration, community connection between each other, uh, but also just being inclusive of our ancestry. I think it's so important that, uh, you're right, you know, it's not in indigenuity, it's not extinct, it's all around us. Uh, and if anything, I kind of beckon and kind of give everyone this challenge to just ask within your, own family, there is going to be a tie-in to some indigenous community in your bloodline uh, if you ask and search far back enough. So um, I, I commend you all for the work you're doing uh, and just, um, yeah, thank you for um, allowing us to be a guest at your home today. And I just love the chemistry you both have and uh, there's many more stories to tell and I, I look forward to hopefully being able to uh, further these conversations uh, in the new year. Uh, and last but not least, I want to thank you all for joining us today's webinar. We deeply appreciate your interest and support in sitting down at our table to learn about indigenous communities near and far through our cultural talk stories. Uh, mahalo, everybody.